Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Ilan Worman, Visiting Assistant Professor of Law at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. We will discuss his book, A Debt Against the Living, An Introduction to Originalism, which is published by Cambridge University Press. So welcome to the podcast, Ilan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, the pleasure is all mine. Um, I really enjoyed reading your book, which is both incredibly dense, but also quite, quite brief. Um, so uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about the project of the book and why you thought that it was something that would be helpful and, and useful to the general public. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess the project, the genesis of the project in some respect was when I was a one out in law school and we were briefly introduced to the debates uh, over constitutional interpretation in my constitutional law one class. But other than that, in you know one day of con law, we don't really talk about these interpretive debates in law school. Uh, in many respects, I think the answer uh, to the questions raised by the interpretive debates are sort of assumed, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people in law school, professors, students, just assume that they're living constitutionalists or that we should be living constitutionalists. And so there just isn't much exposure to the arguments for or against originalism or living constitutionalism. And so I actually looked for an introduction to originalism when I was a 1L. And to my surprise, I couldn't find one. There wasn't one. I mean, there are many great books written about originalism and particular theories of originalism. And I talk a lot about several of them in the book, like, you know, Randy Barnett's book, Keith Whittington's book, Jack Balkin's book. There are some great articles written about originalism. Uh, there are some anthologies of essays, but there was no short single volume, um, you know, single narrative uh, introduction to and defense of originalism. And so uh, I sort of had to strike it out on my own, uh, study originalism and uh, living constitutionalism and the interpretive debates on my own. And eventually, eventually, you know, a couple of years after law school, I just decided to try to write that book that I wish I'd had. So the project tries to distill 40 years of originalist scholarship into 135 pages. It's intended to be introductory. At the same time, it's somewhat of a flavored introduction, as I'm sure you noticed. I take some idiosyncratic and controversial positions, but nevertheless, it's intended to be an introduction. So, Alon, maybe you could just, as a way of situating the conversation, just kind of let readers know, like, in a nutshell, for people who might not already be familiar with the idea, um, what is originalism? Where does it come from and, and how does it work? Yeah, so originalism, and I'll try to be brief about this. <laughs> uh, you know, my book is pretty brief, 135 pages, but I haven't quite distilled this answer to 30 seconds. But uh, this is what I'll say. I, I think we can say simply that originalism today is the idea that we should interpret the Constitution with its original meaning, with the meaning the words would have had to the framers who wrote it and the public that ratified it. In other words, we're not bound by the secret intentions of the framers. We're not bound by how they expected what they wrote to apply. We're simply bound by what they wrote, the original uh, meaning uh, of what they wrote. But I think the approach I take in the book is a bit different. Right? I mean, I, I think that's what originalism is, and that's what I try to defend. But I think originalism stands for an even more fundamental proposition than what I've just stated. I think originalism stands for the proposition that there are distinctions between what the law is, what the law ought to be, and whether the law is nevertheless binding, right? It, it, this might sound confusing, but here's what I mean. This is actually how we think about other legal instruments in our legal system, right? Whether it's a contract or a statute or a treaty, normally we ask, what does this contract or statute actually say? What does it do? What legal effect does it have? And it may turn out, you know, that you entered into a bad business deal uh, on one occasion, or maybe Congress has enacted a bad law. Uh, but very much, I think, an integral part of our legal system is we are nevertheless bound even by the bad business deals, right, that we've properly entered into. And we're bound uh, by even by the bad laws that Congress enacts, right? Now, now, why? Why is that? 
uh, in the case of Congress's laws, you know, I think we consider the, the democratic process by which they're enacted to be sufficiently legitimate, right, uh, to make the laws binding, right, even, even if we don't like uh, all of them, right? Well, so my project is to ask, well, can we make the same kind of argument about the Constitution? The Constitution is also a law, right? A law we the people enacted to bind our legal officials. So the position, the claim I try to make is that we originalists first ask, just like we ask with respect to contracts or statutes, right? What does this Constitution actually say? What does it do? What does it mean? What legal effect does it have? What kind of constitutional regime does it create? Now, once we figure that all out, it may turn out we don't like all of its provisions. Maybe we think it's imperfect. But is there an argument that we are nevertheless bound by the Constitution as a whole, right? Uh, despite any imperfections it might have, just like we're bound by the laws of Congress as a whole, even those of them that, uh, uh, that we don't like. So those are sort of the two inquiries I try to address in this book. First, how do we even figure out what this Constitution says? Right? or means or does. And I, and I argue uh, on this inquiry that we interpret it the same way we interpret any public instruction or communication intended as a public instruction with its original meaning, right? But that doesn't answer this, this question. If we don't like all of what the Constitution says, why should we even care about this original meaning? Why should we treat the Constitution as binding law, just like we treat, say, the bad laws of Congress as binding law? We have to answer that other question. What makes the Constitution binding. Well, and in the book, in some, I, I try to claim that the Constitution is binding uh, if it is an improvement of the kind that Madison described in his famous letter, or not so famous, I'm trying to make it more famous, <laughs> in his letter to Jefferson, in which he said that the Constitution or the improvements made by the dead form a debt against the living. And what must the Constitution do to be this debt, to create this improvement, to be binding? Well, I submit it must successfully balance the two competing primary objectives of a free society, self-government and liberty. And there's a lot to unpack there, but I argue that the Constitution was remarkably successful uh, for its time at, at balancing these two things, self-government and liberty, which you know are hard to balance because they're in tension with each other. But, but more than that, they wrote the Constitution in such a way that it would continue to strike the successful balance long into the future. Now, there's a lot to unpack about everything I just said, but that's sort of the nutshell of, of the approach that I take in this book. Well, I, I like that you bring up the Madison quote because I agree with you that it's a, a really rich idea and it wasn't one that I'd come across before reading your book. So I really appreciate your bringing it to my attention. And I was wondering if maybe talking about that Madison quote in relation to the arguments made by Jefferson to which he was responding uh, might provide a – a kind of an opportunity to reflect on sort of why we have a constitution in the first place. Like, what's it for? Why do we think it's legitimate? Yeah, that's it. That's exactly right. So the debate, you know, so so Jefferson started this exchange, right? In 1789, Jefferson was uh, the ambassador to revolutionary France, right? Uh, so <laughs> he was, I guess, uh, very much living in that moment uh, when he uh, wrote this letter to Madison in which he said that the earth belongs to the living, right? The, this is pretty well known. The, the earth belongs to the living, not to the dead. The dead have neither power nor rights over it. One generation is to another is one independent nation to another. And this has often been quoted for the proposition that we shouldn't be bound by the dead hand of the past, right? By the dead hand of the Constitution and that the Constitution should instead be living and breathing. And what Madison responded, right? People forget about Madison's response. And I don't even know when I discovered it, by the way, you know, in my reading, but it was quite the aha moment when I found this letter uh, in reply. And, and Madison basically said, let's see if I get this right. Uh, if the earth be the gift of nature to the living, then their title can extend to the earth in its natural state only. The improvements, Madison said, the improvements made by the dead form a debt against the living who take the benefit of them. This debt cannot be otherwise discharged, he said, than by a proportionate obedience to the will of the authors of the improvement. In other words, the constitution, he was saying, is an improvement upon this natural condition of the world, right? The, the earth belongs to the living in its natural condition, but the constitution is an improvement 
upon the natural condition of the world of such importance and consequence and magnitude that it can't but form this kind of continuing obligation against future generations, this debt against the living. And the only way for we the living to faithfully discharge that debt is through a kind of originalism, right? A proportionate obedience to the will of the authors of the improvement. And so that's the set piece for this book. This, and it raises the question, does the constitution create this debt? Is the constitution an improvement of this kind, right? That forms a debt against the living. What makes the constitution binding or not? What makes it this improvement or not? This is a, a deep question of political philosophy that is rarely, 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 rarely talked about in the literature, the law review literature on originalism. It's rarely talked about uh, in the law uh, schools. And so in, in other words, I think Madison's letter suggests to us that a full defense of originalism requires at least a limited defense of the founding and the founder's project. Hmm. So I, I want to return to that question in a moment, but as a way of framing your discussion of originalism, and maybe before we dig too deep into the theories and application of, of originalism that you discuss, maybe you could talk a little bit about alternative ways of thinking about the Constitution. So in your book, you explore and defend originalism, but as against what? Like what are what are other approaches people have suggested or or taken with respect to constitutional interpretation and and you know to what extent did those stem I guess maybe from a more Jeffersonian uh, uh, approach rather than the Madisonian one that you're suggesting? Yeah, the funny thing is Justice Scalia, you know, one of the godfathers of originalism, famously joked right that originalism uh, doesn't have to outrun the bear. Right. Uh, in this joke with, you know, the bear is chasing two people in the forest. You don't have to outrun the bear. You just have to run faster than your friend. Right. And <laughs> originalism, he said, runs faster than no theory at all, because there's no theory on the other side. I don't think that's quite fair. I don't think that's quite fair. I do think there's a rich array of non-originalist theories. Uh, one example of which is living constitutionalism, which is the main counterpoint. Right. The main counter theory uh, to mine. So I'll get to that sort of in a second. There are other things, you know, that my book addresses sort of at the end, you know, whether it's Dworkin's sort of moral theory and making the Constitution the best it can be. There's, you know, John Hart Ely, pro the process oriented theory uh, of interpretation uh, and so on. But but the main competitor today, and I think this is what law students understand the main competitor to be, is, is living constitutionalism. Now, there are a couple varieties of this. Um, I think the worst version or, or the bad version uh, it says that, well, the Constitution is just hard to interpret. It's broad and open-ended, so we have no choice but to interpret it, you know, sort of modern-day Americans. Uh, I don't think the premise is right. I don't think the Constitution is nearly as broad and open-ended as these living constitutionalists seem to think. But there's another version of living constitutionalism, a more honest version of living constitutionalism, uh, and it's a very powerful theory. It's it's propounded by those like Andy Cohen uh, at the University of Arizona, so not not ASU, not to be considered, uh, have, not to be confused with my home uh, institution. But he says basically that non-originalism or living constitutionalism is a decent second best way to change the meaning and content of the Constitution over time, right? If the Constitution, right, what makes the Constitution different? than a law of Congress, for example, or a contract. Well, that it's very, very old, right? You might think it has to be changed. Its principles have to be updated. And it's very hard. It's very hard, probably due to historical accident, right? It turns out that the amendment process is very hard. Well, if all those premises are true, then this version of non-originalism is not a crazy sort of second best, best way of changing the meaning and content of the Constitution over time. But make no mistake about it, right? This isn't interpretation. Right. It's maybe limit interpretation in a limited sense that you are bound by the text where it's so obviously clear, like you can't say, well, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez can run for president tomorrow. Right. She's not 35. She can't do that. Right. But other than those really clear, explicit things, they're basically open to changing the meaning and content of the Constitution itself. It's basically a theory of judicial amendment. Now, if you agree that the Constitution is bad and needs, you know, or, or, or not good enough to be binding, right, that it needs to be updated, but it's too hard to do it through the amendment process, then it's not crazy, right? It's not crazy 
to solve Jefferson's dead hand problem by giving judges this power, not to interpret the Constitution, but quite literally to change it uh, via sort of this judicial amendment. And, and, and I think that's the competing approach. And the, the, I mean, the only plausible competing approach, I would say. And for the originalists to counter this, you know, goes back uh, to what we started with. The, the, the originalist has to defend the binding nature of the Constitution such that we should treat it like we treat a contract or a statute or a treaty. And that means as a first cut, we interpret it with its original public meaning because that's how we interpret public instructions, right? Um, uh, and, and so I would say that's the competing theory and, and why uh, it's useful to invoke both Madison and Jefferson and, and their exchange of letters. Okay, so maybe we can return in a moment to the suggestion as I take it that, you know, we have like almost an obligation to be originalists in some sense. But but I think it would be helpful for people if first you described a little bit how you conceptualize an individual uh, an originalist approach to interpreting the constitution to actually look. So in other words, if we're trying to figure out what a meaning of a constitutional provision is, what should we do? What should we look to? What kind of questions are relevant? What kind of questions are not relevant? What kind of evidence is relevant or not relevant to figuring out the meaning of a constitutional provision? Yeah. So for the, right, for the first you know, 15 minutes or so of, of this conversation, we've sort of been focusing on that second inquiry I set up, right? This debate over whether the constitution is binding, whether it should be binding, if there's this dead hand problem and you know, non-originalism is sort of this this better contender if if it's too old and, and insufficient and, and needs this updating. But there's that first inquiry, right, that I mentioned that, you know, first we have to figure out what the statute says or the treaty says or the contract says. Well, how do we figure out what the Constitution says? How do we actually, what does originalism actually look like? And I think the answer is that originalists interpret the Constitution the same way we interpret any communication intended as a public instruction. So the example I use in the book, and this is taken from Gary Lawson, a, a very entertaining mm. uh, analogy that he drew is, interpreting the constitution is in principle no different than interpreting a recipe for fried chicken, right? That you find <laughs> in your great, 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 great grandmother's attic that happens to be dated 1789 and written in Philadelphia, right? Think about it. If you found this recipe, how would you interpret it? Well, you would use a public meaning. Right, not a secret meaning or a esoteric meaning or poetic meaning. Otherwise, it would be a pretty ineffective instruction, right? It would be an ineffective recipe. And well, you would use an original meaning, right? The meaning that the words of the of the, sh the of the creator uh, intended to convey, right? At the time it was written. I think it's that simple. But I think it's important to say uh, that's not to deny the existence of interpretive difficulties. Right, because the recipe is going to have indeterminacy, whether vagueness, breadth, ambiguity. So it could say, for example, add pepper to taste. Right. Well, what the heck do we do with that? Right? Whose taste? How much is that? Does that vary from person to person, from time to time? Who gets to judge? So I think it will be the case that faithful chefs, faithfully trying to implement this recipe, will arrive at a range of plausible results in the world, like a range of actual fried chickens. <laughs> you know, a range, yes, but a circumscribed range. Right. You couldn't just add rosemary to taste instead of pepper because you decide modern day fried chicken eaters don't like pepper, right? You could do that, but make no mistake about it. You wouldn't be interpreting the recipe. You would be amending the recipe. Well, I think the constitution is no different. The constitution is also a public instruction. Again, it's a public instruction from we the people to our legal officials. So I think the common sense answer is we interpret it with a public meaning. Again, certainly not a secret or esoteric or poetic meaning. And we interpret it with it's original meaning, the meaning we the people intended to convey at the time it was written and at the time we tried to bind our legal officials, right, with its words. I think it's that simple, right? So so interpreting the Constitution is an exercise in discerning the original public meaning of the text. Having said that, right, there will be the same issues of indeterminacies uh, uh, and interpretive difficulties as a result of those indeterminacies. So I, I, for what it's worth, for what it's worth, I think originalists too often for a long time focused on originalism's virtue being that it leads to one right answer, right? I don't think that's right. I think it is more restrained, right? And confined than the, the alternatives. But I think it's more plausible to say that as a result of these various indeterminacies, 
a faithful interpreter of the Constitution will often arrive at a range of plausible originalist meanings to many constitutional questions. Now, once we set up all that, there might be ways to figure out what we do within this range. And maybe there we looked at historical practice. This brings in the framers theory of liquidation, which I talked a li little bit about. And Will Bode has a great new article about this, which I guess you should probably interview him <laughs> at some point <laughs> about, about this. Uh, and so we can bring in all these other tools uh, from the originalist tool toolkit at that point. But, but what I've just given, I guess, is the, are the fundamental. Yeah, well, may maybe you could maybe you could deploy some of those for me in relation to a question that struck me while I was reading your book. So I, I, I was wondering if maybe you could provide some reflections on an originalist interpretation of the conversation between Jefferson and Madison itself. Right? I mean, they were engaged in this kind of very high level constitutional theory discussion over something brand new, right? I mean, no document quite like this had ever been generated and, um, and ratified in, in history. And, and I guess from an originalist perspective, how would you read their conversation as evidence of how people thought about the legitimacy and binding power of the Constitution in 1789. And so the first thing to say is, you know, the Constitution was certainly new, but it, but it wasn't that new. The concept of a written Constitution was new to the, to the late 1770s and early and mid 1780s. Uh, but many of the states themselves had had these sort of written constitutions, which what made them different? Right, from the historical British constitution, or what made them different? These constitutions ratified by the people rather than created by the ordinary legislative body. Well, they were supposed to be antecedent to, right, prior to, and superior to the ordinary legislative power. And in other words, this, these constitutions were supposed to bind parliament, congresses, state legislatures, whatever you call them. That was, in fact, uh, an innovative uh, idea, uh, but it wasn't fully new to the constitution itself of 1787, right, or 1788. Actually, there's, I don't know if this is where your question is partly coming from. Jonathan Gnapp has a great new book called The Second Creation, where he argues uh, that the nature of the constitution was unsure, it was kind of indeterminate, and it, but I, I'm not sure that that's right. I'm not sure that that's right. I, I think if you read Gordon Wood and kind of look at the history, this written constitutionalism was new to that era. But I don't think, uh, you know, I think the Constitution of 1787 was sort of the culmination uh, uh, of that. Mm. Now that raises the question, you know, the, uh, of Madison and Jefferson's exchange. Well, okay, if the ordinary legislative power, right, which can change things tomorrow, right, if they have a majority vote, right, if the ordinary legislative power can't change the Constitution at will, you have to resort to the people. And Madison said, well, we shouldn't resort to the people often because you want them to venerate and respect this constitution. We like stability, right? I know that's the one argument. And on the other, you have Jefferson's argument that, well, wait a minute, you know, if this really does bind the ordinary legislative power, well, then we, the people should redo this constitution sort of every 19 years or so, right, by his uh, calculation. And so this is the question, right, uh, of is this constitution binding in the sense that, that Madison uh, uh, described such that even 230 years later, especially as it's been uh, perfected and corrected with the reconstruction amendments and so on, that we can consider it binding, right? Because it's sufficiently good at balancing self-government and liberty. Or was Jefferson right? That because, because it's insulated from ordinary democratic politics, we need to have this recurrence to the people. Uh, more frequently. And I try to argue in the book that the constitution we have is pretty darn good, especially as it's been corrected at achieving this balance, you know, between self-government and liberty. Mm. And here's the key point though. 300 million Americans can have 300 million different opinions of how they would write the constitution different, how they would rather balance self-government and liberty. But of course, that then every if, if, if that was enough to defeat the binding nature of the constitution, then we're back in a state of nature where everyone decides for themselves, what they think the law should be. And if it's not that, then they're not bound by it, right? The, the point is there must be some threshold where we, the people today, 
today, not as a matter of blind veneration to the past, right? But today, continue to recognize and accept that this constitution successfully balances self-government and liberty. And, and if we agree with that, then I would submit that it is binding and that Madison was right. So uh, I kind of went a couple of different directions there to your question. But, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was fascinating, actually. And, and, and I guess the the question, the follow up question that I can't help but reflect on is, I mean, do you think Madison was right in the moment or did it turn out that Madison was right. Was it like an open question when they were having this debate or was Madison right all along? I think that's an extremely perceptive question. I don't have a good answer to it. I think for sure it turned out to be correct. Now, now, uh, there was a fatal critical flaw in this original constitution, right? The flaw of slavery. And maybe Madison was wrong to begin with because of this critical flaw. Now, I, you know, I'm not sure, right, if the Constitution, to be binding, must successfully balance self-government and liberty. I'm not sure this Constitution was binding on the slaves, you know. I'm not sure that the slaves didn't have every right to rise up and slaughter their masters, you know, and, and try to engage in a constitutional revolution. Because obviously the Constitution didn't successfully balance their self-government and liberty, right? So, but, but for the other people in the polity at the time, surely it did that uh, successfully. I think it turned out that way. Now, it turns out that there was this critical flaw that suggested, especially over time as we became more enlightened, right, uh, that maybe the Constitution didn't successfully strike this balance because of slavery. And, you know, maybe we can ask this moot hypothetical academic question of what would the world be like today if we were as enlightened as we are, but still had slavery. I mean, it's something of a contradiction, right? But if that were true, then I guess we should abandon the Constitution and Madison would have been wrong. Because for our time, uh, this constitution wouldn't successfully strike this balance. But we don't have to think about that because we became more enlightened and we took the constitution along with us. We created those reconstruction amendments. Uh, and so the constitution with uh, certainly, I think, was successful for its time and was binding in its time. That original constitution, without the correction of the Reconstruction Amendments may not meet that standard today. But I think with the Reconstruction Amendments, with the abolition of slavery, the guarantee of equal protection of the laws and the due process of law, right, and the guaranteeing of black suffrage in the 15th Amendment and the 19th Amendment, female suffrage, women's suffrage, right? With those corrections, I think certainly today, the Founders Constitution, as originally understood and as corrected uh, by these amendments, continues to strike this successful balance today. So was he right at the get-go? Well, it's complicated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, this really reminds me of a conversation I had the other day with, with Paul Gowder about um, exclusion from the Constitution yeah. or from the constitutional polity. And, and, and it seems like, you know, gradually over long periods of time, our society, our government, our concept of the constitution has become increasingly inclusive and added people to the polity who previously had been right. excluded from it. I, wa I wonder how you think about how that historical shift affects the legitimacy of the constitution itself. I think to the extent that our constitution, uh, you know, is not corrected and changed and amended, whether it's to include, to, to abolish slavery, to bring the freed blacks into the polity completely, to bring women into the regime, maybe to bring 18 year olds into the regime, right? To the extent that the constitution that, that we consider today, that those are necessary parts of the polity that have been excluded, right? To the extent the constitution continues to exclude them today, maybe it's worth abandoning the constitution or as we've done, amending it, right? That's in fact, uh, uh, that's in fact what we've done. But this question, right, the fact that there used to be excluded groups that now are included, right, I think so long as they are now included, you know, I, I think that means we can still be bound by this constitution, even if they weren't included in the past, right? Because think about the argument, right? If we were not bound, you know, to anything done in the past because of some excluded group, well, who's to say that we should be bound by anything we do today? Because in a hundred years, 
who knows what group we will, you know, conceive to have been excluded from from 21st century American politics and the political process. There are people today, you know, who who believe that, you know, the structural hierarchies of society and so on uh, uh, systematically exclude certain groups. OK, so we can amend the Constitution today. We can re-ratify the exact same words. But who's to say that's legitimate or binding if in 100 years, right, we'll have become more enlightened and look back at it, right? So, so I think what this shows is we have to be wary about what the historian E.P. Thompson called the enormous condescension of posterity, right? The Constitution was legitimate and binding for its time. It has to continue to be legitimate and binding for our time, right? But the fact that 150 years ago, it wasn't sufficiently good or just to be binding by our modern standards 150 years later, I think that argument doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So in, in your book, you, you talk, uh, to some extent about sort of background interpretive principles that may or may not be fully determined by the actual language and context of the constitution itself. And just as one example, I'm thinking of like the, the tension between the, uh, arguments for the presumption of constitutionality as opposed to a a presumption of of liberty how how should people who who kind of accept your argument in favor of an originalist framework for interpreting the constitution think about those kinds of tensions that don't necessarily seem to be like directly answered conclusively by the Constitution itself. Oh, well, this is a bit unfair of you to ask me because I say it's one of the great unanswered questions you know, <laughs> in <laughs> constitutional law, which is, I guess, why you're asking it. Um, well, I think, you know, the first thing I'll say is there isn't too much at stake in this debate. Now, maybe, maybe this is my hubris talking, but the more I look and study the Constitution, right, the more I think uh, the range of options it actually gives us is pretty limited or determinate, at least I should say. I think it's reasonably easy to figure out the possibilities allowed by the Constitution in many cases. Uh, and so and so, what do you do, right, uh, in that sort of space where the Constitution might lead to sort of more than one an plausible answer? And I think the ultimate method is not the presumption of constitutionality or the presumption of liberty, but it's this method of liquidation where the, you know, the, the democratic branches, the political branches, Congress and the president, the states, the people themselves, whether like in the election of 1800, uh, where arguably we, we were, we, the election was sort of an act of constitutional, constitutional interpretation about the Alien and Sedition Acts, right? Uh, and the courts all together sort of debate and discuss and deliberate over the meaning uh, of the Constitution uh, uh, over time. Now, what happens, you know, when we're within this debate and you're asking ourselves, Okay, so we're trying to figure out what the Constitution means. The evidence is sort of on both sides. Do we presume that Congress can't do something and the people are free? Or do we presume that Congress has enacted something that's constitutional? You know, the, the number of times that, that the interpretive arguments are really, you know, like on this line, um, on the margins of, of, of what's plausibly allowed by the Constitution, you know, I, I think are astonishingly rare if they exist at all. Uh, I think more often than not, the Constitution creates this range of plausible meanings. And if we're within that range, it doesn't make sense to talk about presumption of constitutionality or presumption of liberty, right? If we're within that range, right, multiple options are possible. And then Congress, the courts, the executive, and the people themselves ultimately have to sort of settle on a meaning. And maybe after the election of 1800, we settled on the Republican meaning, a broader meaning of freedom of speech, you know, and rejected the alternative plausible Blackstonian reading, you know, that by the Federalists. Maybe mm. that's a, a nice uh, example of that. But again, the debate, presumption of constitutionality, presumption of liberty, if we're within that range of plausible options, that debate doesn't really matter. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so Alon, in, in closing, I was wondering if you could re reflect on something that you kind of addressed in the latter part of your book, which is sort of the, I think, very common understanding uh, of Brown v. Board of Education as essentially a, a kind of litmus test for the legitimacy of a theory of, of constitutional 
interpretation. And, and I was wondering if you could talk about why you think Brown works in that way and how originalist legal thinkers should think about Brown in relationship to the arguments that they're making and the historical context surrounding the Reconstruction Amendments and, you know, the struggle over, over civil rights and the fact that, you know, it, it seems like the language of the Constitution as originally understood wasn't obviously consistent with the illegality of segregation. Yeah, so this is a great question. And so start, so breaking it up into, into two sort of questions. The first is, you know, this is, this is kind of weird that, that there are constitutional law professors who say, well, no method of interpretation is legitimate if it doesn't lead to the result in Brown v. Board of Education, right? In some sense, this is backward, right? In some sense, we have to do as I said, which is first, let's just figure out what the Constitution means. And then if it doesn't lead to the result in Brown v. Board, we have to talk about what we do and what the ramifications are, right? But on the other hand, this isn't a crazy position, right? Because as I said, the government, uh, the Constitution, to be binding at all, has to meet this threshold of legitimacy. It has to meet this threshold balance of self-government and liberty, right? It doesn't have to be exactly what you think it should be or what you want it to be, because we can have 300 million opinions about that. But it does have to meet this threshold uh, of, of, of legitimacy, of justness, of, of balancing self-government and liberty. And if, you know, Brown v. Board might be one of those cases. If we had a constitution that allowed this separate but equal, maybe this constitution would not strike this successful balance that I described and should be amended. And if we can't amend it, should be abandoned. And if we can't abandon it, maybe we should be not originalists, right? So, so I actually give more credit to that claim than many originalists do, that, that we have to lead, we have to get the result uh, in Brown. Okay. Now, putting that aside, I actually think Brown v. Board of Education is an easy case, an easy case under the original meaning of the 14th Amendment. Now, I actually don't talk, uh, I talk a little bit about Michael McConnell's evidence, how the first interpreters of the 14th Amendment, the Republicans in Congress in the 1870s, thought the 14th Amendment actually required desegregation. But put that aside, right? The, the textual argument, which I don't really talk about in this book, but it's actually going to be uh, featured heavily in my second book, <laughs> in equally short 135 mm. pages, by the way. And it's called The Second Founding, An Introduction to the 14th Amendment. This is not out yet, and it's probably a year or mm. two out. But here's the argument in a nutshell. It's a Brown v. Board of Education is a hard case under the Equal Protection Clause. Why? Because protection of law right, meant something very specific. So the Equal Protection Clause actually means equality with respect to something specific, the protection of law. What's the protection of law? It's the flip side of due process of law. Due process says that the government, only the government can take away your life, liberty, and property rights, and only according to established law and known procedures. Okay, that may be disputed on some points, but I think that's correct. The protection of law is the flip side. It's the protection the law must afford to your exercise and enjoyment of those rights, your life, liberty, and property rights, as against private interference. This means the government must protect you against private violence. It must protect you against mob rule. It means that the government must provide you remedies in court access to courts so you can sue for trespass or battery, right? It means the government has to prosecute murders and so on. I won't get into it now, but this is how Blackstone used the term protection of law, and it's how Marshall and Marbury v. Madison used the term. So protection of law, the Equal Protection Clause, doesn't get us Brown v. Board. It just doesn't, right? Because the protection of law says nothing about the content of your liberty or property rights. It just says whatever those rights are, the government must give you protection of law so you can enjoy and exercise those. Okay. Having said all that, Brown v. Board is an easy case under the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment. This clause says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. What was this clause intended to accomplish? It was an anti-discrimination provision with respect to state-protected civil rights, state-created privileges and immunities. How do we know this? Well, because the problem confronting the Reconstruction Congress was the Black Codes. The Black Codes in the South, system after the Civil War, systematically denied Blacks the same rights that whites enjoyed, right? Whites could assemble, Blacks couldn't. Whites could own guns, Blacks couldn't. This was the, this was the problem. So Congress enacted the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which said uh, that people born in the United States, including the newly freed slaves, are citizens of the United States, right? And as such citizens, 
as such citizens of the United States, right? They are entitled to the same rights to sue, to contract, to own property, right? As is enjoyed by white citizens, right? What does this do? It doesn't define the contract rights. It doesn't define property rights, right? All those are, are state law defined. What it does say is however the state defines those rights, it must give them equally to black and white alike, right? And to, uh, to every other citizen without arbitrary discrimination. Well, I think the evidence is pretty overwhelming that the Privileges or Immunities Clause was intended at a minimum to constitutionalize the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And if I'm correct about this, right, and, and not to just constitutionalize it, but to enshrine its requirement into the fundamental law. If I'm mm. right about this, then the Privileges or Immunities Clause is an equality provision with respect to state-created privileges and immunities. What does this mean? Once public education isn't simple, once education is not merely a social right, but once it's public education, once it's government funded education, once it's a privilege of citizenship, right? On the one hand, and on the other, once we know what everyone in the South knew, that the purpose of the segregation laws wasn't separate but equal, but was in fact unequal, right? Once we know what everyone in the South knew, that the segregation laws were intended to keep one race of Americans in perpetual subordination. Once we know that, and once public education is a privilege of citizenship, I think Brown v. Board is easy. It's a three paragraph opinion under the original meaning of privileges or immunities. Well, Ilan, thanks so much. It's been really great to talk to you about your book, which I got to say, um, I think is kind of a, I was really impressed that it's like both really accessible uh, for for students, but also got a lot of really rich ideas in there that I hadn't uh, necessarily encountered elsewhere before. So, um, well, you know, I really appreciate you saying on, that, and I really appreciate I really appreciate that you had me on the show. As a result of the war between the states, the next major step in the protection of individual liberty came in Amendment 13, Section 1. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. This amendment prohibited slavery and peonage in the United States. It has been held that certain state laws were in violation of this amendment, where they had the effect of jailing a debtor who did not perform his obligations. The Supreme Court has ruled, however, that selective service laws and laws requiring forced labor as punishment for crimes are not prohibited by this amendment. Amendment 14, Section 1. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. On July 23, 1868, the highly important Amendment 14 became part of our Constitution. It protects Americans from certain types of state action, thereby increasing their individual rights and freedoms. It provides for the rights of citizenship to both naturalized and natural-born persons, and proclaims that a child born in the United States is a citizen, even though his parents are aliens. The Due Process Clause of this amendment has been referred to many times. It has never been fully defined, because its definition cannot be imprisoned within the treacherous limits of any formula. It was Mr. Justice Felix Frankfurter who said, Due process, unlike some legal rules, is not a technical conception with a fixed content unrelated to time, place, and circumstances. Representing a profound attitude of fairness between man and man, and more particularly, between the individual and government, due process is compounded of history, 
reason, the past course of decision, and stout confidence in the strength of the democratic faith which we profess. Elusive as its meaning may seem, the Due Process Clause has made the 14th Amendment one of the most important in our Constitution. It prohibits all state public officials and all private persons acting as agents of the state from acting capriciously or unreasonably in the exercise of their authority. It limits the power of the states and all subdivisions as to what they may do and how they may do it, and to a substantial degree protects persons against state action in the same way that we are protected against federal action by the Bill of Rights. The Equal Protection Clause of Amendment 14 prohibits a state from making arbitrary or unreasonable distinctions between different persons as to their rights and privileges. For example, the Supreme Court has held that a state cannot arbitrarily deny to some of its citizens the right to attend a public university or school open to others, to serve on juries, or to enjoy the advantages of public parks and beaches. Nor may it arbitrarily tax some citizens by a different standard than other citizens similarly situated. Nevertheless, the state remains free to make reasonable classifications. <laughs> 